William, let's uh, start with perhaps what's probably the most obvious question. What do you exactly mean by unicorn? Yeah, well, uh, it actually started with uh, we have a pool in the backyard and the kids get a different float every year and uh, they wanted a unicorn float. <laughs> and, I was thinking at it. and so the, the whole premise of the book is how do you stand out in the crowd like nothing else? And we, mm. we tried stand out, but there's a great book written that's called stand out and there's actually a software tool for it. And so that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. And one day I was thinking, you know, the unicorn is what, you know, the, in the tech world, that's the, the darling startup. Um, it's the thing that stands out in the crowd and who doesn't like one. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of androgynous. So it doesn't matter men, women, whatever. Um, but the, but the general premise was we, we wanted to write, a book based on a lot of research we did about what we're finding about the very top, top, top candidates that we've interviewed over the last 15 years, and then create a guidebook for people to be able to practice some of those same habits and make themselves stand out in the crowd, which, which I think is actually a bigger problem right now than people realize. Hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, for the first time in U.S. history, we've got five different generations in the workplace at the same time. Never happened before. And so it's crowded. And am I too old for this? Am I too young for this? And don't get my voice heard. It, and and it, I, frankly, there's a sixth generation no one really wants to talk about called AI. It's not Gen X or Y, it's AI. And it's going to take a lot of jobs. So how do you stand out? And as a church leader, like, my goodness, you know, my pastor said to me, William, I don't know if people are ever going to come back to church. And I said, why, Tom? And he said, because now they've figured out they can they can go live to Matt Chandler's church or Steve Furtick's church or and I'm not that good a preacher. And I'm like, Tom, Tom, there are other ways that you stand out. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would imagine there's some listeners today. They're like, how do I, you know, we can't copycat anything anymore because everybody can see everything. So. How do I, as a pastor or a church leader or a lay person, uh, stand out of the crowd? And while it's not in the Bible, I think everybody's like, the unicorn's kind of this mythical thing that's pretty cool, and, and it stands out. So that's a long-winded, recovering preacher answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you our team will be serving more than 100 pastors this uh, in these last 12 months, and every one of them um, is looking for the unicorn. And here's the good news, um, William, everybody listening to today's podcast wants to be the unicorn. So this should be a fun conversation. Um, and so let's look back. I mean, you've been doing this for 15 years. You have 15 years of research. What what did you find is the most important of the 12 traits that you outline and, and why is it the most important? Well, it, it might be helpful to give a little origin because because what I don't want is William's opinion on the 12 things that will make you stand out. That's not what I want to write. I don't have that informed an opinion. Oh, uh, you know, I, I like I call them quant qual books like quantitative data with qualitative stories and uh during the pandemic, we shut down. You know, it's funny. I, I didn't go to business school. I, I have a religion and philosophy degree. Uh, and as I tell people, you know, people with philosophy degrees spend their whole career saying, would you like fries with that? And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm learning as I go. And what I learned in the pandemic was a uh, business lesson. Uh, if every one of your clients closes indefinitely, uh, it will affect your P&L. And you're going to have a lot of time on your hands. And uh, so we, we spent a whole lot of the pandemic trying to serve churches with resources for how do we get through this. But we still had time on our hands. And, and we realized in a search, which you're fairly familiar with, uh, but for those listening, you know, you hire us to find a student pastor, exec pastor, head pastor. Uh, it, you know, you start with a very wide funnel at the top and maybe there's 1500 people that are under consideration. And then it very quickly drops to maybe 100 or 150 you're taking a serious look at, and then you do Zoom interviews and you review preaching or worship samples or whatever, and you get down, down, down. And when you get down to the very best of the best, maybe the last eight or 10, um, they get a long format face-to-face -face interview. Uh, and uh, we realized during the pandemic, you know, we've done 30,000 of those long format face-to-face -face interviews. So wow. the very best of the best, 30,000 of them, and, and 
we said, could we find who among that 30,000 is actually even better than those? Like, who are the unicorns? Mm -hmm. And can, you know, who got the job, who kept the job, who got promoted, who, you know, who really brought value? And we figured out who that was. And then we said, do they have anything in common? And the answer was yes. And it was counter to everything I expected. The, mm. the list, um, you know, is it 12 traits that make, it's not even traits, it's habits. It's not, they're all six feet tall and they have great hair and teeth or they have a 160 IQ or they went to, I don't know whether to say UGA or Georgia Tech. I don't know which one's, you know, the right for your, for your state, but um, what these people did across all socioeconomic strata, they all shared the same 12 habits that they practiced. And we saw them in the interview and you can see it in their work and it really makes them stand out like a unicorn. So to answer your question, which of the 12 habits is the most important? I think that depends on what job you have. Hmm. So like uh, to use business terms, if it's sales and marketing uh, or to use church terms, if it's someone in charge of visitor follow-up, or first time donor follow up, which would, I, I hate to sound crass, but that's a fairly congruent uh, analogy. Speed or fast responsiveness is absolutely the most important thing. In a noisy world, if you get back to people right away, you will win. And the truth is no one gets back to people right away. Our friends at Generis have done a big study that show that the number one way to reach and impact a first time donor have you heard this? No. The pastor on that Sunday texts the donor thanking oh. them for their gift. Is that not wow. wild? Yeah. I mean, that, sounds, that would have sounded invasive to me, but it's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to say thanks for your gift of this amount, but like person to person right away, it, it speed, right? But, but mm -hmm. then on the other hand, like, if you're hiring someone to do your accounts payable or your bookkeeping, I don't know that innovation is the top habit for them. <laughs> right. I mean, we tried, right. we tried innovation in accounting here in Houston years ago. We, we called it Enron. <laughs> Enron. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't wear, a lot of people that did that wear orange now. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I think it depends on the job. And what's really cool is in, in five years, it might be three, we will have tracked, we, we built a software tool that helps people assess where they are. It's actually pretty cool for 360s. So teams can assess people, see where blind spots are in these 12, what do we work on? Super cool for development plans, but we'll be able to, uh, in, it'll probably take three years of collection, collecting data to say, oh, campus pastor and we do live preaching. Well, probably we need somebody with these as their top four gifts. Hmm campus pastor and we do broadcast teaching. Okay. We need these top and it's going to be a really cool gift to the church. But for now we've got a written resource uh, that should let people uh, hone in on what their gifts are. And if they take the, the sort of software inventory, they can immediately see here are the three that I need to work on. And you don't have to read the book in order. You can go to whichever habits you want to read first and work on. And uh, it, it, I'm hopeful that it helps a lot of people. Well, on that note, uh, give me your take on this. Do I mean, do you think some of these skills or habits are teachable, learnable, or are all of them? Some okay, all right. All of yeah. them. They're super teachable. And and that's kind of what the book does. It's like, here's a case study in in uh, uh, an innovator. Here is what we heard from unicorns in innovation. Here's some data behind that. Here's some easy steps for you to take to, to develop a sense of innovation. It doesn't mean you're a super creative. It just means you're approaching the problem with, could we do it a different way? Um, speed is just like, get back to people. Like, I remember as a young pastor, um, I'd been called to a church that was trying to relocate. So we moved them and we were looking for a... Uh, we were in a Seventh Day Adventist church. I got lost on the way there. My first two weeks serving as the pastor, it was a horrible location. And uh, I was riding around with a guy that had been on the board several times, pretty connected guy. And right across the street from our uh, property that we purchased was a YMCA, brand new. 
And Todd said, uh, William, I don't I don't think they use that YMCA on Sunday morning. So that's cool. And he said, I know the board chair. I'm like, great. He said, wait a minute, let me get you his number. So he writes down a piece of paper. We're standing in my office. He said, you should call him. I said, I will. So then he stood there and looked at me for about 30 seconds. He said, why haven't you called him? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm standing here with you. He said, I'll wait. He said, William, let me tell you something. The very first opportunity you have to respond is the best one. Hmm. And I never forgot that. It's made me a little maniacal. I probably ought to see a therapist about it. But uh, the get back to people right away, you'd be shocked how many friends you can win, how many new visitors, how many volunteers that did a great job on their first day, you know, that uh, just getting back to people. Nobody does it because, you know, I pick up my phone. I've got. Five, well, I've got a good looking bride, but I've got five different <laughs> platforms to answer. You know, my LinkedIn messages and Facebook and the Insta, like ah, nobody gets back. So they're all learnable. It's just a question of whether people will put in the work. I love that. All right. So here's the great thing. I think uh, th over the years, pastors and church leaders have really started to lean into some of the tools that are available profiles to help us understand who we are who our teammates are, who we're looking to hire. And they're using things like Enneagram, leading from your strengths, uh, working genius. Where do you see your framework kind of dovetailing with these other offerings and where might there be some differences? Yeah, well, I think they all complement one another. I mean, for, for 15 years, we've tried to say, what is the one inventory we're going to tell our clients to use? There isn't one. You know, uh, and they keep being new ones. And I think, uh, you know, I think Socrates, very little of what he taught was written down. One of the things everybody says, yeah, no, he used to teach this a lot was know yourself. And frankly, I think it's the better part of what Jesus was saying when he said, don't worry about the log and the other guys, the splinter and the other guys. I get the log out of your own. I don't think he was saying you should be ashamed of yourself. I think he was saying you need to get to know yourself better before you can help others. Hmm. And so, you know, big fit. We're using working genius right now. It's fantastic. And we love the Enneagram. We know how to talk to each other because of that. We used insights and disc and what, what we what we think this will help with. And we built this tool. We called it the Vander Index, just for lack of a bit more creative thing to call it. Um, it takes the 12 habits and where do you rank yourself? And then it'll show where you rank yourself and how it matches against the general population and the tens of thousands of people who've taken this, where you rank against the unicorns, right? And and that's fine. That, that's helpful. The reality is most everybody um, is an easy grader. <laughs> One of the habits is self-awareness. <laughs> it's the least common habit that's practiced of the 12, okay, just from the wow. data. So when we asked, so after we, you know, figured out all these habits, we surveyed a quarter million people, you know, to try and build this software tool and quarter million people surveyed. 91% um, of them said that they're above average in self-awareness. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody's not self-aware then, well, yeah. I'm not, I'm not but, you know, you know, like, so your grading is it, it will help you because you'll see where your highest and where your lowest, where your top and the bottom, and you'll get a report for here's how you work on these things and all that. Uh, but the real value will be when you let your boss take it or your board chair, if you're the pastor, about you, and then where you have a subordinate take it about you, and then you get to see it's kind of I don't know if you know the flipping profile. It's a similar sort of uh, or Lominger. It's a, a similar sort of way of saying. Here's how I perceive myself with these habits. Here's how people around me do. And now we can build a development plan. And that that's about as fun as going to your physical after you're 50 as a man. But it's, uh, you know, it, it necessary and helpful. And I think, uh, you know, it will complement and not compete with all these other wonderful tools that I'm so excited church leaders are using. 
Yeah. And that you're, you're kind of alluding to the fact that it really as a 360 tool, then uh, really helpful because then you get the perspective of uh, not only self perspective, but those around you. And I can see where that could then really be insightful to help us know what are the next steps that we need to yeah. be taking. And, the, and the, what sounds like good news, but actually ends up being sobering news is you pick who you want to take it about you. It's not mm. like we pick the crabby board member that doesn't think you can do anything right. It's like you pick your friends to take this about you. And then you're going to see, oh, wow. Okay. There's some things that I can, I can do real fast to become a better person and a better servant and stand out of the crowd. And you know what, William, I think most pastors, most church leaders, they actually want that honest feedback because yep. they do. They want to they want to maximize the potential of the giftedness that God has already put into them. Um, you talk in the book about standouts and that they have a strong sense of purpose and they want to find an organization whose purpose aligns with their own. So how do you recommend um, kind of understanding that strong sense of purpose in the interview process. If you're, if you're looking for that as well. Yeah. I, you know, did you read this article that came out a couple months ago about the guy, why I left the ministry? He was at a fairly good sized church in uh, the Chicago land area. And it kind of went viral among churchgoers and non churchgoers. There's just a lot of people dropping out of ministry a whole lot. And, I don't know that that's altogether a bad thing. Uh, I didn't realize when I went to seminary, when I, when I got to Princeton, I'd go to lunch with different people every day. And I was the only guy around the table that didn't have a, a, a dad or an uncle or a granddad who was in the business. Wow. Like when I told my family, I th thought I was going to go to seminary, we had a big family dinner. My grandmother said, oh, good. Now we have one to get us all in. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so that's not that's not how it works but go I ahead I so, but you don't correct your elders right so <laughs> that's um, right but i think there are a lot of people who have gone into ministry because it's the family business and that's not a purpose you know right. and and i i hope that the book will help people drop back and say well what do i want to be a part of like Maybe it's a different kind of church. Maybe it's time to revamp your, maybe it's time to get unstuck as a church. <laughs> maybe it's time to, you know, get a clearer vision for what your particular vision for the church in your setting is. Like when I was at First Pres Houston, we, we hired a company to help us with this. And I, they told me things I never saw. We're right in the middle of the largest medical center in the world. We have People like I was routinely the dumbest guy in the room, which I know many people are thinking, well, <laughs> duh, but, you know, I can kind of hold my own, but nope, very smart people. And and it led us to say, you know what we do? We engage minds and guide hearts into a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. We started putting on like science and theology forums and medicine and and it it just gave us not just a great commission purpose, but like. Oh my gosh, right here, right now, this is, as Paul said of David, this in our day, in an hour time, here's how we serve God. And I think a lot of churches uh, have a great opportunity after the pandemic to ask themselves that. I think mm -hmm. ministry is more localized than ever now uh, because the ubiquitous is available on YouTube or church online platforms. So uh, my, my hope is uh, pastors actually score higher than average on having a purpose, this 12th habit. Uh, but I think it can always get a little clearer, right? I think sometimes in my journey, I've thought I've had a sense of call and purpose, but it's kind of like the guy Jesus healed where he was blind and Jesus touched his eyes and he said, can you see? And he said, well, a little bit, you know, the people look like trees. And then it took another touch to get clarity. And I, I think that's what what I'm learning I have to do in my journey, and, and hopefully that'll help some others along the way as well. Well, while we're talking about the interview process itself, uh, let's uh, help senior church leaders know um, what are some of the specifics that they need to be considering as they're looking at potential candidates um, and interviewing them for jobs? Yeah, and, and I, Tony, I don't know the profile of the church you're listening that's listening but i know the profile of the church in america is about 110 people on a sunday right yep. so we're not talking multi-staff 
But we are talking about what kind of volunteers. I used to just try and, as my other grandmother would say, go scare up some volunteers. <laughs> uh, bad idea. You need to interview your volunteers and interview them case specific, right? So like speed for, you know, uh, uh, donor follow-up. Um, and if you decide that, that your job needs speed, when you're interviewing them, and this borders on entrapment, but you, you've heard me tell this story. Speed is super important at our office, not with every job anymore, now that we're bigger and have multiple teams, but with sales, marketing, consultants, absolutely. So when we interview them, great interview, yay, yay, yay. And then 10 p.m. that night, they're going to get a weird text from someone that they don't know that's in our office. Hey, thanks so much for taking time. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet you. I'd love to connect sometime. If the person doesn't get back to them, they're not like going to lose the job. But if they get back to them fast, even if it's, I just got home, I'm with my kids. Could we schedule a time to talk next week? Just anything that shows this one gets back to people. I'm probably going to get screamed at by the blogosphere for saying that. You, you're you a mean, abusive boss. No, I'm not. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Because we expect that kind of speed and responsiveness. And if you don't have it, the last thing I want to do is put you in a job where you're suffering and you're miserable and you don't fit in. So I, I think it's, and your listeners are smart. I mean, people really are smart. And mm -hmm. I think if they'll just think like, what am I interviewing for here? And how do I uh, shape the interview in a way that will test for these habits? Because I don't, you know, they are teachable and learnable, but when you're interviewing, they need to kind of already be, the key ones need to be there. For, for instance, maybe you're looking at a, a creative designer you know, that'd be a big church uh, or something that requires uh, learning on the job. We're just starting to first time we're hiring an online campus pastor and it's a half time job. And we're just doing somebody local. How do, somebody's got to learn on the go. Right. They, they need to be agile. I've been known when I'm interviewing someone where agility is a key factor to move the interviews venue. An hour before the interview and not move it, you know, long way away, but hey, man, you know, there's a really better cup of coffee about six blocks down that way. Could we meet there instead and just see? Because some people don't do well with that. I have lots of very talented, good friends that don't do well with that. Fine, but don't take a job that demands that, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just using your brain a little bit to say, of these 12 habits I'm interviewing for this job, what are the three that really need to already be in place? And how do I construct an interview around that in a way that will... Uh, surface the answer without asking the question. That's very good. Uh, again, along the lines, uh, the lines of interviewing, what are some of the characteristics of a unicorn that might be most misunderstood or often overlooked uh, by someone in the position of hiring? Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, the self-awareness piece is overlooked. So, so in general, I think interviewing, interviewing in particularly in churches reminds me of like my high school years and really bad dating experiences uh, where, you know, I would clean my car extra clean and maybe wax it. My car was never clean. That's not who, you know, I am. I wasn't then anyway. Uh, and then you date you know, maybe doesn't eat for four days and wears something they can't wear and they look and I'm doing push-ups right before I pick her up, you know, like just trying to put on uh, an image of, of the very, very best of me without being real honest. And I, I tell, uh, I tell our team, you know, we're called to a lot of things in our search work, but one of them is nobody walks down the aisle with Rachel and wakes up next to Leah. Right. So let's just have an honest look. And and I, I think that self-awareness is a big piece of that, both on the interviewing side and on the interviewee side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for instance, Tony's interviewing me for a job. Tony asked me the question, tell me about yourself. And he's already told me how great his company is. And he's trying to tell me the greatest version of his company that there is. And then I try and tell I, I was most likely to succeed in high school and I went to Wake Forest undergrad in Princeton Seminary and I'm, I'm listing accomplishments. That's not self-aware. 
here's self-aware. Tony, um, I know that your company is growing and it's into problem solving and helping churches get unstuck from a rut. I love jobs where I have to solve problems I haven't seen before. I love working with people that really want to get better. And I can show you in my last job, I had uh, a particular client that we had to revamp the whole way they were doing things, uh, even down to their email system. And it mm -hmm. grew their email lists 3X and of course list all those things. And, and I'll just tell you, Tony, as, a, as an Enneagram 7, I love going from problem to problem. I don't want to work with one client my whole life. I want to bounce around. So what I'm learning about myself is uh, the things where I thrive are the kinds of things that you're doing as a company. And that's why I'm excited about this interview. Yeah. Yeah. So even that basic, even that basic question of what are you learning about yourself could be pretty insightful. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of self-awareness, William, uh, this is many years ago. I was with a team. It was a team interview setting. We asked the candidate, potential candidate, one question, and it was along the lines of tell us a little bit about yourself. That candidate then proceeded to talk for 45 minutes, the entire amount of time that we had allocated for the interview slot. And we only asked one question. So did this candidate have self-awareness? No. And that became a problem later on too, by the way. Uh, so very, very important. All right. You mentioned and, earlier. And, and just, just one little piggyback. I think on the interviewing side, I don't hear interviewers tell candidates what they're struggling with as a company. Ah, yeah. And I don't, I mean, unless you, unless you're hiring somebody who's really unaware of what's going on in life, I doubt you're going to surprise anybody. I mean, I wouldn't go into the deepest, darkest things, but I think some honesty about where we're trying to get better as a company, we really have to do a better job of this. That's going to win you a lot in the interview process and maybe even open the door to the candidate saying, well, you know what I've been learning. And uh, if you can have that conversation, that's uh, the, the self-awareness piece you wouldn't think matters in an interview, but it, it could be the ballgame. No, that that is a great insight, William. And I've shared uh, for years, leaders, great leaders gravitate to big challenges, big problems. They, wa they want the next, the next big challenge to overcome. And leaders gravitate more to problems than they do positions because they want to know as a leader, is there something for me to fix? Is there something for me to conquer? And so I think the more self-aware that the organization can be to talk about some of those challenges, you might actually find you are better able to attract the higher capacity leaders with that, with that kind of transparency about what you're struggling with. Totally. All right. Last, last question. Uh, you referred to this earlier, just the number of generations now, five generations working together. We know from our research at the Unstuck Group that younger leaders, the, especially the millennials and Gen Zers, are the most underrepresented generations on, on church staff teams right now. So uh, can you give any insight into how older leaders can spot younger unicorns before they've built that pre that proven track record? This is um, before they've actually had a lot of experience in leadership themselves because they're younger. Can you help the older folks um, that are listening understand how to kind of discern, is this somebody that really does does have potential. Yeah, read the book. Okay. Read well, the book. I mean, that sounds trite, but read the book. Get get a handle on this. This is not William's opinion about 12 things people ought to do. This is hard data. The very best candidates, irrespective of age, education level, socioeconomic structure. These are the 12 habits. I, I remember spotting them in uh, a woman that you uh, came along at, well, I spotted him in Holly long before I knew what the 12 habits were, hired her at 23 years old, amazing. And then uh, last year, well, two years ago, we hired a young woman who had interned with us uh, to kind of help out with marketing. She ended up running the whole thing. And at 24, we put her on the lead team. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not like, I don't know that I have ever gotten to a place where it's like, Oh, they need to be on lead team at this age. It's it, it it's harder than that. 
it's more like, man, they really are special. And I, and it's the, uh, our friend Craig Grishel says, you know, if you surround yourself, uh, if you, if you, if you hand out tasks, you'll surround yourself with doers. If you hand out authority, you'll surround yourself with leaders. And so I'm, I'm trying to learn, and I think it's an art. What are the calculated risks I can take in giving some authority on projects that if they fail, it's not the end of the company, right? But it takes some leadership to do that. And I, I kind of tested Krista through two or three of those. And it was like, yeah, no, she belongs on the lead team. And of course, she just left to run an amazing, amazing ministry as their number two. And I'm bemoaning the fact that I don't have a Gen Z on my lead team anymore. I've got to go figure that out. So I, you know, it, it, the, the problem with putting the really good young ones on your team is you're not going to keep them. And you better just get used to that. So I used to call people my team and my people. And I'm realizing, no, you know, that that's almost heresy. They're Jesus people. And he mm -hmm. can deploy them where he wants to. And if I get to enjoy them for a while, that's great.